Hello everyone, my name is Amari Souza. I'm an assistant professor at Texas State University, and I'll be sharing with you guys some of my research today. The presentation that I'll be giving is titled African Americans in Advertising, Images, Stereotypes, and Symbolism. Who we are as individuals, each habit and belief that we hold is an extension of the rituals and structures of our various cultures. We are inevitably shaped by the language of visual symbols presented by those who wish to change or maintain those rituals and structures. Our society is steeped in visual narratives, often utilized by journalists, politicians, and other opinion leaders to perpetuate cultural myths about the products they offer and the consumers who need them. In this consumer-based society, designers play a vital role in crafting visual narratives giving designers a vital role in determining how individuals view the world through the kaleidoscope lens of the visual symbols within advertisements. These narratives are used to illustrate the dynamics of social power and ideology we use to create meaning. Brands distribute signs that consumers can interact with, use, and remake. Brands are often equated with feelings of authenticity, patriotism, and community, means by which people make meaningful connections to others. Those with the ability to exercise influence continuously over time are able to shape culture and solidify ideas of hierarchy. They do this because it's much harder to convince someone to change their identity than the type of material in their shoe. Brand wield their power to set forth an ideal version of their customer. One that the customer wants to identify with because they see in it some of the things they either see in themselves or desire to. Take Nike Apparel for example. Once known as Blue Ribbon, Nike Incorporated is an American multinational corporation engaged in the design and selling of footwear and apparel. The name Nike was chosen by Jeff Johnson, a Blue Ribbon employee, in homage to the Greek goddess of victory. The goddess is symbolic of the desire to win, and the Nike swoosh represents her speed and power. Images generate meaning for the interpreter, but those meanings are interpreted through all of these elements working in conjunction. Because the images and icons used to support a brand exist in a world that contains ideologies, those images and icons must interact with those ideologies for harm or for good. Nike's pairing of the swoosh symbol with athletes like Michael Jordan, Mia Hamm, Roger Federer, Serena Williams, and Tiger Woods created a connection between the products and the champions who endorsed them. The products, in turn, became considered the choice of champions. The brand thus sells the idea that in order to become a champion, buying into the brand is a necessary first step. Nike not only sells sports apparel, but commodifies an idealized self which is only actualized through the purchasing of their products. A brand is a visual symbol that signifies the user's social status. Designer Hank Willis Thomas explores the connection between modern brand and the genesis of the concept in his series Branded. He connects the original meaning of branding to burn signs of ownership onto the flesh of livestock, to the history of slavery, and then the relationship of product branding to black culture. In the modern context, this forced branding of human beings has been meaningfully done away with. However, voluntary branding has replaced it as a way for individuals of lower social hierarchy to show their lo loyalty to those above them. This new form of branding does not demonstrate ownership, rather it is used as a form of social mobility for those on the bottom of the hierarchy. Africans and their descendants who were once bought, sold, and traded as commodity were unable to control social perceptions of themselves. The commercial narratives that describe them did not include possibilities of an idealized self, but rather the subservient self who provides the ideal for others. This includes characters such as Aunt Jemima, Uncle Rastus and Cream of Wheat, as well as Uncle Ben, have all remained as constant reminders of the servile positions African Americans once held. On Jemima, the first living trademark of a company has been a vital tool for advertising campaigns since 1889. 
Utilized for over a century, the pancake mix figure represents the continuity of the mammy stereotype. The image of submissive blackness ended after the American Civil War during the period of Reconstruction. Newly freed blacks began to obtain social, economic, and political rights with the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment to the Constitution. Wealthy whites feared the political power that newly freed blacks could acquire via voting and poor whites saw blacks as competition in the labor force. This caused a transition in the depiction of African Americans from compliant and submissive servants to savages and brutish monsters, threats to the status quo. The black brute, who was innately large and animalistic, functioned as a tool to link African Americans to criminality. In 2011, Nivea created a series of print ads. This ad concept was designed to fall under Nivea's four men's broader campaign, Look Like You Give a Damn. What sparked outrage about this ad series, the difference in the copy written for both the white lead model as well as the black lead model. The ad featuring a white lead read, Sin City isn't an excuse to look like hell. The spot featuring a black model features a neatly dressed model hurling the decapitated head of another black man with an afro and beard. The ad's message, re-civilize yourself. The visible difference between the two subjects is limited to skin color. Hair texture, as well as the suggestion that one is less civil due to an external appearance. The widely distributed ad implies an African American hair, as some have suggested about the body, needed to be controlled and maintained in order to be culturally accepted. Sign, unkept black male, signified uncivil. The concept of the brute also made its appearance in the controversial 1915 epic, Birth of a Nation. The film depicted the Ku Klux Klan as saviors of the post-Civil War South, overwhelmed by Northern politicians and freed slaves. The assertion that black brutes were in large numbers sexually assaulting white women became the public rationale for lynching of black males, most notably in the murder of Emmett Till. In 1955, 14-year-old Emmett Till, an African-American from Chicago, was brutally murdered for allegedly whistling at Carol Bryant, a white woman who was a cashier at a grocery store. His attackers were Brian's husband and her brother. The two men beat him nearly to death, dug out his eyes, shot him in the head, and tossed his body into a river. The men were caught, tried, and found innocent by an all-white jury. Emmett Till, a native of one of Chicago's middle-class black neighborhoods, was visiting relatives in Money, Mississippi at the time of his death. The fear of rape or sexual assault of white women by African-American males would have devastating effects on African-American communities. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, a young white woman accused the black male of sexual assault. This resulted in the death of roughly 300 African-American residents and left more than 9,000 residents homeless after white mobs destroyed the Greenwood community. The depictions of African-American males as brutes continued its significance into the early 20th century. These depictions of black criminality resulted in the passage of stricter sentencing guidelines in prisons and the expansion of the war on drugs in the second half of the 20th century. Stricter prison guidelines grew in the American prison system exponentially by 700%. During this time, campaigns for tough on crime policies emerged as popular sound bites for elected officials. For example, George W. Bush's presidential run used a smear campaign tactic formerly known as the Willie Horton ad. This 1988 presidential campaign TV spot created by Bush's supporters was intended to attack uh, Democratic opponent Michael Dukakis. Dukakis, the then governor of Massachusetts, supported his state's weekend pass program, which allowed imprisoned individuals to leave prison for a day or more to, to go home. The spot featured convicted murderer Willie Horton, who had escaped while on a weekend furlough and went on to rape a woman and stab her fiance in a brutal 1987 home invasion. While the ad overtly discussed a single black man, the subliminal and larger takeaway is that Willie Horton's face became synonymous with all blackness. As political science professor Claire Kim said in a 2012 PBS special, the insinuation is, if you elect Governor Dukakis as president, we're going to have black rapists running amok in the country. Lastly, a prime example of how the brute image still thrives in society today is the April 2008 Vogue magazine cover of professional basketball player LeBron James holding a supermodel, Giselle Bundchen. Vogue was widely criticized for a front cover that saw the sensationalized Brazilian supermodel being held by the much larger NBA player 
in a manner which resembled a vintage 1917 World War I poster. The poster depicted a gorilla holding a white woman, the caption beneath the title, Destroy the Smad Brute. James's posture in combination with his face in mid-roar and Bunchen's dress in a gown similar to the one worn by the poster's female lead provoked allegations of racial stereotyping. These types of images draw on past racial stereotypes and myths reinforce criminalization and are now coded with the terms such as thug today. The brute character was a fallacy and a myth adapted to maintain social control mechanisms as well as sustain the white fear of black communities. The recent deaths of Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, Walter Scott, Sammy Du Bois have heightened the tensions regarding the use of force when policing black neighborhoods. For many police officers accused of shooting an unarmed male of color, bail has been essential in their legal defense. When I grabbed him, the only way I can describe it is it felt like a five-year-old holding Hulk Hogan. The Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson said of his encounter with Michael Brown, the language utilized harkens back to the brutish stereotypes of black males. In many instances, the officers explained that their level of intimidation was rooted in their inability to control the person in front of them. For that reason, violence seemed eminent. By dissecting cultural and historical meaning in images, we can explore the dynamics of social power and ideology that produced them. While historically in America, overt racism was more prominent, cultural shifts of intolerance to blatant racism have made this kind of imagery less acceptable. This does not mean that these images no longer exist, but rather that they live as coded narratives gestures, signs, and symbols to indicate difference. If the design community takes into account the social impact of the narratives we create, this community could influence the way society understands and treats the humanity of others. Thank you all for your time.